Okay, recording. Okay, and welcome back to our series when we're getting to know a little bit more about the Negro League players for the Dream Team canvas that I am going to be painting here in my hut in England. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the first base position to begin with, and then we're going to be talking about second base. Um, I have my panel of experts in front of me here, and I would like to just uh, let each of them be able to tell, to tell you a little bit about themselves and... Um, just give themselves a brief introduction. So let's start today with Leslie. Hi, <laughs> I'm Leslie Heafy. Um, I'm a history professor at Kent State Stark, uh, Sabre member for a long time. Um, I write about the Negro Leagues and women's baseball and was part of the 2006 committee that elected the 17 Negro Leaguers um, at that time. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Obermeyer. I've uh, written a few books on the Negro Leagues, including a couple of uh, biographies of owners, Carmelyn Posey and Ethel Manley of the Homestead Grays and Newark Eagles, respectively. I was also on the 2006 uh, Hall of Fame committee, and I have done, I've shown up in other people's books as a researcher, uh, writing chapters as they have in mind. So we, we trade off a lot in our business. Excellent. Last and not least, Ted. Oh, and uh, my name's Ted Knorr, and I'm not an author. I'm a, um, I guess, a 30-year member of the Sabre mm -hmm. Negro League Committee. And uh, as Jim says, we do try to support each other, and I do more supporting than, than original research, research, but I'm very happy to be here. Can I ask you a question about that? Your Sabre Committee... How do people join it if they want to if they want to join it? How do they get in touch or where do they do First it? First thing you want to do is join Saber, of course. Right. But then you're going to find Saber has a committee for whatever your desire is: women in baseball, umpires, uh, Latino baseball, uh, 19th century baseball. So you just find the committee that you think you belong in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no better one than the Negro League committee, and we've been around as long as Sabre has, 1971, wow. this committee began. When you join Sabre, they list all the committees and all you do, do is check a box of which okay. ones you're interested in and that automatically puts you on the list. And you don't have to, you can be purely a consumer of information or you can be a contributor. Either way, anybody can be a member of whatever committee they want. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. So let's move on to our, our third baseman. We need somebody to fill this position. We've got three uh, suitable candidates. We've got Ray Dandridge, we've got Judy Johnson, and we've got Judd Wilson. Um, let's start with Ray Dandridge. I've got a little bit of biographical information here. He was elected into the Hall of Fame in 1987. He was born in 1913 and he died in 1994. Um, what can we, or what should we say, or what are the the main strengths of Mr. Dandridge. I always, I found the most interesting comment that a lot of people have made is, and it was the headline of a couple of articles written about him, and it's the best third baseman to never make the majors, because uh, he never got that opportunity. He had a great Negro League career and a great minor league career, but never had that opportunity with Minneapolis. Uh, he was rookie of the year with the Minneapolis Millers. He was the MVP with the Minneapolis Millers in the minor league system, but um, brilliant uh, fielder, powerful arm, quick reflexes, quick hands. That was, you know, and everybody of course knows him for his, he was uh, bow legged uh -huh. <laughs> and the stories that abound, um, one of them being, and I can't remember who said it, you guys will have to remind me that a train could go through his legs, but a baseball never would, right? <laughs> and because it isn't that. Um, but he was, he could hit to all fields. That was, he wasn't a power hitter, but what he was known for was being able to hit to all fields and just connect um, with the ball. Um, and so uh, he studied, according to at least his own stories, um, one of our other candidates today, Judd Wilson, to sort of learn a little bit about playing the game and, and watching him playing third base. I'm not sure if that was such a good idea when we get to Wilson. We'll talk about some of his issues in playing third base. He had a unique approach to playing third base, but, um, but Dandy was uh, a, an appropriate nickname for him because it appears that's what he was in the field. Excellent, excellent. 
That's the biggest part of his Negro League career with the Newark Eagles, uh, although he wasn't with them uh, when they finally won the National League pennant in the World's Negro World Series, but he was the third baseman on what, well, the term million-dollar infield had been thrown around in the majors since, I don't know, the teens or 20s. The Philadelphia Athletics uh, infield in the 20s had that name. So they gave it to the... Uh, uh, Newark infield of the late 30s, which had Dandridge at third, Willie Wells at short, Dick C at second, and Mule Suttles at first. And it did, if you'd invested in that infield, it would have paid off, I guess. Three of the four are in the Hall of Fame. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> Dandridge had, uh, had uh, you know, the seam heads, uh, the best Negro League statistics. I think we all agreed on that a, co a couple of episodes ago. A ne um, normalize stats over 162 games to sort of make them match up to what you might expect if you followed the mainstream major leagues. But Andridge is a 338 hitter, and yeah, not a lot of homers, as Leslie said. Leslie said uh, normalized is 41 doubles every 162 games, so he could he had some line drive power. He could spray that ball around. Mm -hmm. He's also um, during a war. He went to Mexico for most of the time. He was, he's actually in the Mexican Hall of Baseball Hall of Fame, too. Played with uh, somebody, Veracruz, <laughs> for several years and played well. Hmm. Veracruz, yes. Yeah. When you when you talk about the way that uh, seam is seam heads, isn't it? He, Seamheads.com mm -hmm. normalized the stats and for 162 games. How many games would you say would have been typical in a, in a Negro League season? It depends. Really? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, well, seriously, um, if you go back and do the research, in the 20s, they seem to, in the 20s, there was one league centered in the Midwest, not an enormous amount of traveling. I guess it must have stretched from north to south, from Detroit to St. Louis. So there's, you can find records of about 80 league games a year. And by league games, I mean games that are scheduled. And sometimes, sometimes to make a little extra money, uh, two Negro League teams would play each other off the schedule. An exhibition game, statistically, we're counting them all. You know, a major league team played a major league team. Was it on the schedule? Did it count the standings? We don't care. Okay. But the, the top flight players were pitchers who were pitching to the batters. The batters were hitting or not hitting the pitchers. Mm -hmm. Later on, I, I guess in the 30s and 40s, probably scheduled games probably ran about 60 or so games a season. But then things happened. Most of the teams didn't own their own parks. They rented usually from um, mainstream minor or major league clubs. When the other, when the owners were on the road, and if it rained, you couldn't just play the next day because the owning team may be coming back and bumping you out. Mm -hmm. So some of those teams, some of those games rather, didn't get played. But statistically, we can gather stats of probably fifty to sixty or so games a year. Okay. And, right. and one thing, Andy, the, the comparison between major and Negro leagues. The Negro Leagues, as Jim says, year to year, it varied and team to team and league to league, whereas in the major leagues, it was a, mostly 154 games every year, and every team, as best they could, played 152 to 154, weather depending. Mm -hmm. So that's a major difference between the Negro Leagues and, and the majors. The Negro League players, though, they would be playing 150 to 200 games because they would make money when when they weren't playing major league teams, either on the road or in some cases at home, mostly on the road, mm -hmm. uh, selling tickets to people who in, in rural areas often, uh, great distances between the, the cities. Barnstorming was you, you played till you got to the next place. And so if there were three or four places on your trip, and you could fit them in, that's what you did. And right. in order to keep the team afloat. Right, and, and supplementing your income, 
Mm -hmm. um, generating more fans, I guess, all, all of those things. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, so on Dandridge, yeah, I just want to add, we did talk about his sterling offense statistics, which, which actually they're very good it's, it's when you consider defensively he was even better. He has the highest fielding percentage, and he, he got to more balls than the three, the other two third basemen we're talking about. Uh, so Dandridge is, is certainly my, I'm glad he leads off because he's my favorite of, of these three. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to Judy Johnson, uh, elected into the Hall in 1975, born in 1899 and died in 1989. Um, Again, I've got the, this is the, the Hall of Fame al almanac that I, I'm dipping into. And there they, they're citing him as being the, one of the best third basemen to play in Negro League. Um, and again, this is along with Ray, Ray Dandridge and uh, Judd Wilson. Um, he's got some, I mean, his slugging percentage is very, very good. Um, what else should we say about Mr. Johnson? Another very good glove man. He could hit too. He's about a 300 lifetime hitter. Uh, very good glove man. The One of the sidelights or, uh, of the Seamhead site is they, they sort of provide full service and stats as best they can. And they have a list at each position of the best players, down to the worst players, I guess, ranked by that, uh, the uh, someone somewhat obscure to me. I don't know how they figure it, but I'll accept it. Wins above replacement statistic. Um, Johnson's fourth all time, but interestingly enough, his fielding war is the best of all of these players, third baseman, where, and I, and I realize that, that it's, it's complicated and dense and all of that, but it, it does have meaning. He's, he has a, about 30% of his wins above replacement are accounted for by his fielding statistics. And that's, that's pretty high, that's very high. Yeah. He was mentored by Pop Lloyd. So in talking, we were talking about Pop Lloyd. And so it's interesting to see the many connections that we find among the various, particularly at this top rank. It, it shows you something, I think, about the Negro Leagues in terms of their willingness and ability to um, to work with one another. And, 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 and so um, he was also not only a fine third baseman, um, he was described, I think it was by Composey, Jim, you have to, as a fielding gem. Uh, that was the phrase he used. Um, he was uh, a manager, a scout, and a coach as his career. So not only was he able to do his work on the field, but he was able to translate that into other players and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, he was described as a by a number of players in, uh, in a diff series of different interviews as a quiet, unassuming leader. That He, he didn't say it. He didn't have to. He, his actions spoke for him but he was seen as a leader and uh, respected by the other players uh, and described as a, a clutch hitter. Um, he captained the 1935 Pittsburgh Crawfords, that amazing team that uh, came out in the 1930s, five Hall of Famers, including himself, uh, and he was the captain of that team. Yeah, pretty good. He had a lot of respect in the business. And an interesting <laughs> thing is when the Negro Leagues, Negro Leaguers started to be recognized by the Hall of Fame um, in the 70s, a committee was formed to elect the first, I think, I think nine before they disbanded. Mm -hmm. And, and Judy Johnson was on it, on on the committee and in the Hall of Fame. There's some inside baseball there, but well, he <laughs> even if not, we'd have, he'd have been scooped up to the Hall eventually. <laughs> he went into the Hall the year after he went off the committee. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was on till set and then he went in the very next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and on, on that issue, I do find it interesting that Dandridge and Johnson were both alive uh, at the time of those committee meetings. Uh, and you, I think we just answered one of the legs up Johnson had. But uh, another leg up he had is he was actually, he had just retired from baseball after that committee formed. He, he was a scout for both the Phillies and the A's and the Braves. Yeah. Uh, I think up to 1972, yeah. whereas Dandridge uh, 
was in recreation and I think he also was a bartender, but uh, those, those occupations put Johnson right in the limelight and right in the game. So that might be why he got in other than Dandridge at, to be the first third baseman. Okay, all right. Let's let's move on to our our third choice for third base, and that is Judd Wilson, um, elected into the Foot Hall of Fame. I, I assume by uh, Jim and Leslie in two thousand and six, and he was born in eighteen ninety six, dying in nineteen sixty three. Um, now, obviously, you two are responsible for getting him into the hall. You must have some good points as to why he deserves to be there. The thing that oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say the thing with Judd Wilson. Judd Wilson that always is the, reading the descriptions of how he played third base um, and the description particularly of him, I mean, just imagine of him using his, learning to use his body to block the ball on a regular basis because he just, he wasn't the greatest fielder and it turned out to work pretty well for him. So he did it a lot. And then the pattern became that he would uh, continue to play through some serious injuries, he broke his arm once um, and came back in two weeks he broke some ribs, um, and so these kinds of things were not uncommon for uh, Wilson. Um, he also had some minor injuries because he also um, tended to argue with every umpire on every call that he possibly could. That was sort of his reputation, but it's his field. The fielding part of it is always um, was not his strength. His strength came on the hitting side of things, and course that's where his nickname came from as well supposedly about the sound the ball made when it hit the outfield wall because uh, uh, he hit it boo -jum. Yeah, boo -jum. Boo -jum. yeah yeah what a great um, he was described by a number of players as and a number of managers as the uh, pitchers as the hardest hitter they had ever seen that he could hit the ball harder than anybody um and so uh, he was rather aggressive <laughs> and quick quick to uh, argue with people a great player. Leslie, when you say about, you know, he had broken his arm, he had many injuries, he's playing through them. I'm assuming in the Negro Leagues that, you know, if you're injured, you could lose your place or you could get cut from the team. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. There wasn't any, there wasn't any other opportunity. Uh, there was no going on the DL or anything like that. Um, and so that's partly why many of them played through. And sometimes that cut short their careers if they, because uh, we certainly saw that. Um, and Wilson managed to play through most of his or come back very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. The only other thing before I'd pass it on, I was looking at the uh, uh, seam heads again because I was very curious. And this, the stat that stuck out to me with Wilson, and again, this is a little problematic, as Jim would point out, because of the w way box scores were kept. But I still find because I went to look at other players, and, and I'm like, okay, in his 162 game normalized numbers, he has – 73 walks and zero strikeouts, zero strikeouts. I just found that, and I never saw another player who, with the kind of, with the length of career that he had, that has that number of anybody we've looking at. That's a pretty impressive, and I, I, I recognize the difficulty, but it's still pretty impressive that he comes out with, in a normalized season with zero. Yeah, that's, that's a good eye. <laughs> uh, when we, uh, oh, on that, uh, Leslie, if you look, at uh, other players, uh, especially Pancho Cambre, although he literally didn't strike out. He, he One or two strikeouts a year is about all he literally did. But in the case of Wilson, uh, I think that's uh, a lack of, and I, I understand there's probably box scores that have strikeouts in it that he played in, but uh, I, I, Having looked at even Dixon's got some very low strikeout numbers, I think he has some zeros. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a failure to incorporate sure, but, the strikeouts. But they include walks, and a lot of times. Oh, I know. Well, walks. Side uh, by side in walks the are a more important uh, offensive indicator. Uh, but you're right; that's a very good point. Uh, they, they do include walks, and they're they're almost as not reported as strikeouts. So strikeouts are, the pitcher strikeouts are recorded, the batter strikeouts aren't. Sometimes batter walks are, but, but you're right. That, that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, as long as I got the mic, let's talk about uh, Judd. His offensive numbers, and we discussed this yesterday, are outfielder-like. That's what, that's what makes him so great. And he, uh, on the Courier poll, I think he's listed as both a first baseman and a third baseman 
in, in the third team or on a roll or, or something. Mm -hmm. so, so Judd was a corner infielder and he hit like, like the best of them. Uh, and uh, the courier poll puts him on, I think, the third team. Uh, he was a late comer to the hall, but Jim and Leslie got that job done in 06. One Hall of Fame he's in, too, that we should mention. He's also buried in Arlington National Cemetery. He didn't have combat duty, I don't think, but he served in World War I. Uh, Wilson is, um, well, he's got longevity on his side, which, as you know, I love. He had this great career uh, where playing with the Baltimore Black Sox, I think, were probably his most out, during his most outstanding years. And he got old, but he didn't get that bad. And in the, in the 40s, uh, during the war, of course, Negro League players were getting drafted and enlisting just like the white ones. And the Negro League owners were scratching around to fill out their rosters. And Cumberland Posey of the Grays, who had had Wilson for a little while in the past, signed him again. He played the whole war as mostly a reserve, although one year it was good to have him around as a first baseman because the starting first baseman, Buck Leonard, broke his arm partway through the season and Judd stepped right in. He played until in 1945, till he was age 44. And it wasn't as if he was right in the end of the bench. He wasn't a full-time starter, but he was still out there. He was still hitting the ball in the high 200s, the 300s. Uh, that's 23, you know, 23 years, correct? So I think that, that's... Yeah, that's, thereabouts. Yeah, hey, when, we, when we looked at the list of nominees in 2006, of course, it had been a while since any Negro Leaguers had been elected to Hall. And there were, in my mind, there were six or eight... You looked at six or eight of these people and you say, where, why are they still not in the hall? This is so easy. You don't even need to think about it. And Judd Wilson was one of them. Mm -hmm. normalized saved, us a lot of, saved us a lot of time to argue about the rest. <laughs> His normalized average on team is 359 yeah. with 130 ivory eyes and 117 runs scored. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Well, quite, quite a trio to choose between there. Okay, well, look, thank you very much. That is our free um, players for third base. Um, we'll leave this video here. We're going to cut it there, and then we will come back soon um, talking about second base. So thank you all very much for that first half, and we'll take a quick break and then come back for second base. Thank you. Okay, let's quickly stop.